Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Melanie Sampson. I'm an associate professor of sociology at the University of Johannesburg. And uh, this uh, webinar is part of a series that we are doing on integrating reclaimers. The first webinar was in August. It was on gender and waste picker integration. The second webinar that we had last month was on partnering with reclaimers for waste picker integration. And today's webinar is focusing specifically on landfill reclaimers. The webinar series is co-hosted by UNIDO, the CSIR, Wits University, where I was previously located, and the South African Local Government Association. The series and the project that it is part of are funded by the government of Japan. So we, we decided it was very important to focus on landfill uh, reclaimers in this webinar because they're a group that we find are increasingly overlooked in discussions on integration. Discussions on integration and separation of source have really been focusing on street reclaimers and I think that's because they're more visible to us. But of course, a significant amount of recyclable material in South Africa is still going to landfills. And we have a very large and important population of landfill reclaimers. They're being squeezed in two different ways at the present moment. First of all, as we implement separation of source, the per definition, the amount of recyclables going to landfills decreases. So a number of reclaimers are saying that they're starting to see the river of recyclables dry up which means that they have a lower income. At the same time, many of our landfills are very close to closure. I think that in Johannesburg right now, every single landfill is scheduled to close within the next three to five years. And as we are moving towards the reality of landfills closing, the question is what then becomes of the reclaimers who have extended their lives as long as possible by providing this great service uh, to the city, to residents and, uh, and to the environment. So uh, that is the focus of today's webinar. What I would like is to ask all of the speakers to turn on your videos just while I uh, quickly introduce you. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a really fantastic group of speakers joining us today. Uh, the first is Eva McQuenna. She is the chairperson of the African Reclaimers Organization, a member of the organizing team member, and she is a landfill reclaimer, and she will be kicking us off uh, by discussing her experiences and as well her um, suggestions and, and proposals based on that experience on how we need to be integrating landfill reclaimers. After Eva, we have Musa Chamane, who is the waste organizer at the environmental justice non-governmental organization Groundwork. Um, Musa has been working with reclaimers and supporting them to organize for more than a decade. He works very closely with the South African Waste Pickers Association, as well as other groups of reclaimers across the country. And he will be speaking to us about how can we actually leave legally um, or legalize the reclaimers who are already on our landfills through uh, amending landfill licenses, which is something that is actually possible, but many municipal officials are not aware of. Next, we have a duo. We have uh, Peter Cohen and uh, we have Yuren Ijgose, and I'm very sorry, Yuren, for how I've just pronounced your name. Um, and they are currently working together between them. I don't know how many decades of experience they have. Um, it's many, many, many decades of experience in working with uh, reclaimers actually across the world. And uh, recently they've been doing uh, really interesting work on social plans for reclaimers when landfills are closing. And so that's something that we're wanting them to focus on today so that they can share their experiences and, and the lessons learned. And then finally, we have uh, Federico Pada. Uh, Federico is the Latin American waste picker coordinator for the uh, action-based policy research network, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. And uh, he will be sharing with us some of his experiences from Latin America. So uh, with that, I will ask the speakers to turn off your, your screens. 
uh, except for Eva McQuenna, who is going to be the first person I speak to. Just for the audience, you are all on mute. You can type in the chat box and you can ask questions there or in the Q&A. And uh, you have been, uh, as I might have mentioned, you're muted at the current moment um, so that we don't get interference. But please do tap in your questions and your comments uh, into, into the Q&A and into the chat. And uh, the way that this webinar is, is structured is it's more like a conversation. So I will be asking questions to each of our panelists, and then we will leave a substantial amount of time for, um, for you to ask questions and to engage with them. So Eva, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we know that you are supposed to be working, reclaiming right now, earning your living. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge um, and proposals and ideas with us. So, so Eva, just very briefly, uh, as a landfill reclaimer and as a, as a woman, uh, particularly, what are the key challenges that reclaimers are facing at landfills right now in, in South Africa? Okay, hi everyone. As Melanie has already said, I'm Eva Mukwena, chairperson of Aro, and also working as an organizer and also as a negotiator for reclaimers. Uh, as a, a, a female reclaimer, I'll talk about the challenges first that we face in the level field where we're working. Uh, it's about power first. You need to stand your ground because if you don't, some men, they take advantage that we are women, then they overpower us in getting materials. You'll find out that if there is, a, there is something that needs more power, we as women, we are disadvantaged because of the strength that we have and because of we are women. Uh, I'll talk about two landfills that I'm involved in. I'm involved in Palm Springs and also in Averda, where I'm making sure that all reclaimers, because in Averda there are, there are three groups, the groups from my Maya and Boisins, then is the groups that is the main group, which is the Changalalas. So the role that I'm playing here is to make sure that the groups get along just fine. No fights. They discuss everything together. So at Palm Springs, I'm playing a role on uniting reclaimers. Yes, as a woman, it's really hard because some of the, I won't say men, Specifically, I'll say some of the young boys, they've got this thing of saying, no, we cannot be ruled by a woman. No woman can come and tell us what to do. And again, the challenges that women get, it's when they're supposed to go to the toilet. Because on the landfill, there are no toilets. And it's just an open space. Sometimes there is no privacy at all. When you want to wee, you must use a bag, just get inside a bag, cover your head and your body, you sit down, then you wee. Where you are working, of which is not hygienically clean, because you're working here and again you're weeing here. So those are the kind of challenges that we get. But in most of the cases, we make sure that we, we, we educate the claimers of equality, that as we are here at work, we are equal because we are doing the same job. Then there is no one who should be above someone else. So those are the kind of things that we're dealing with on a daily basis. Thank Great. you. No, th thank you so much, Eva. And I think it is really important what you're bringing out that we, we focus uh, rightly so on the tremendous power inequalities between reclaimers and industry, between reclaimers and municipalities and the injustices that you face in those relations. And at the same time, what you're highlighting is that there are power relations between reclaimers yourselves and the gender is an important um, line of, of power. So, so uh, I was very interested that you said you are educating people about equality. And um, 
you also mentioned that the role you're playing at, at Averda is to ensure that there's peace between different groups of reclaimers who are coming from different areas. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us first, what are some of the things that you are doing to educate uh, your male colleagues about gender inequity and why it is important to redress that? And then secondly, what are some of the very practical things you're doing at Averda to maintain this peace that you've played such an important role in creating? Yeah, uh, uh, okay. Thank you, man. Uh, uh, as a woman leader, uh, normally, I normally make an example about me that people didn't choose me because of my stem. People didn't choose me because of maybe they are afraid of something. So people need to understand there are some of the things that men cannot do, like being patient. Men are not patient, to tell the truth. Men are not patient. Men cannot fight until the end. Some they'll turn away. So most women, they fight. Like I'm a fighter. I fight for what I believe is right. So those are kind of things that we're trying to show them. And to show them that we, 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 we're working as a team, we need their support to make sure that we go forward. Because without their support, there is no arrow. Let me put it like that. If like there is a name arrow, but without members, then there is no arrow. So in order for Aro to exist, it has to have members. It doesn't matter whether a leader is a woman or it's a man. But the fact remains, who has the ability to push forward? And again, uh, according to Averda, now we are in the process of, of speaking with the municipality, the, no, no, the, the, the management of Averda. As you know, Averda is a private landfill. They didn't allow reclaimers. We even went to court. We won the case even now, but now they are trying to, they, they, are, they, are, they are accepting that reclaimers are there. Even they even told GTI that you cannot chase these people. They are making a living. So all we have to do is to work together in order for us to achieve every goal that GTI is looking for, because we need proof that reclaimers are there. They are saving an airspace for the landfill. So that means we need tonnages that are coming out of the landfill. So we must work together on accomplishing that. And to make sure that all groups are on this together. We hold meetings. I go to their meetings. I attend each and every meetings that the management is calling. Even the reclaimers committees are calling. I'm always there to make sure that there is peace. If there is no understanding, I'm trying to explain to them on how to resolve everything in a peace way, not in a difficult way that people will end up getting hurt. Because in, like first we, we did get difficulties into different groups here at Averda where the Basutu tribes were fighting, were fighting amongst each other because of the groups, tribes. There was poison, which is rainy, then there was my Mai, which is another group. So they were fighting amongst each other towards the work that is happening in the landfill. But as Arrow, we came up with a plan to show them the importance of working together in order to accomplish whatever they are doing because the work that we're doing, we're feeding our own families, we're taking our own kids to school. So that's when we ended up being in a police station, signing the peace agreement. And since then, the peace agreement was signed in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, or 2018. Up until now, there was no fight between these two groups. Now we are trying to formalize all the groups into one. Then they can form one group that's saying the same thing. That's talking to the management with the same word and agreeing on everything. Instead of, no, we are the Basutus, 
we we are the ones who are supposed to make decisions. No, everyone must be involved in this. Thank you, Mayor. No, th thank you so much, Eva. And I know that many of the participants uh, in this webinar who are coming from municipalities are facing issues on landfills in terms of divisions between reclaimers on landfills and, and are often unclear of how they can deal with that. So I'm sure during the question period, um, some people might ask you for some more details about how you brokered the peace agreement and what does it mean and how do you uh, keep um, reclaimers together at the landfill, which is such an important success. And, you know, really congratulations to you uh, for your really hard work around doing that together, together with your, your other comrades and, and colleagues from Arrow. I, I want to ask you one last question. What would be just, you know, one or two, just a very few things that if, if you would say to the municipality, if you're going to integrate landfill reclaimers, these are the three things that you really should be doing to get us started. Okay, the, 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 the first thing that they need to do as the municipality, it's inclusion. They must stop making decisions without us. While those decisions are affecting us, we are the ones who are doing the job. The companies that they go fetch, they come here and do everything. It's not us. The second one, they need to register us. Show us that they acknowledge the work that we do. Instead of us, instead of them separating us as, as reclaimers, now we've got this group, we've got that group and that group. No, we're not working with that. We are united here. And to tell the truth, the people that they, 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 they separating from us are the ones who are doing more job than us South Africans. The people who are coming from outside countries, they are the ones who are making South Africa to win those awards that they are winning in recycling. So that's what the municipality must stop doing. And again, the thing that the decisions that they're making are affecting us. The municipality should, 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 should change the bylaws that are affecting reclaimers mostly. They should talk, they should engage with us, talk to us and see what we need. Because the work that we do, it's not as easy as they think as pulling trolleys on the street. No, it's not. And everything is affecting us. Whatever they are doing, whatever decisions they are taking, some they are affecting us. And again, we've got two organizations that are representing reclaimers that I have come on board. Like even national, it's Arrow and Salpa. They should stop dividing us saying, no, this one is from Saupa, this one is from Aro. We as reclaimers, we are one. The organization are just umbrellas that represent us, but we are one because we are doing the same job. Thank you, Mary. Great, thank you so much, Eva. You've given us a lot to think about and I think some really clear um, ideas for municipalities of how to start taking that first step. So now um, I will ask Eva if you can turn off your camera and ask Musa to turn yours on. Musa, I think you follow you know, perfectly well from Eva because what I would like you to explain from an environmental uh, justice organization perspective, why do we need to uh, amend landfill licenses so that we can have uh, reclaimers, waste pickers continuing to work on landfills? Uh, Musa, you're on, you're on mute. Thanks, Melanie, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, yeah, as we know that uh, landfills, uh, they normally have licenses that are issued by Department of Environmental Affairs. And each and every person or the municipality who wants to have a landfill site, they have to apply for a license from Department of Environmental Affairs to get a permit or to get an authorization. And uh, most of them, in South Africa, when I say them, I mean municipalities, 
they do have licenses, even though they are categorized because they are licenses for hazardous waste or toxic waste, and they are licenses for general waste like recyclables that are being picked by waste pickers in different corners of South Africa. So to answer your question, Melanie, uh, municipalities have got a right to uh, uh, make an amendment to their license. They need to do an application to environmental affairs to say, even if the license hasn't been hasn't expired, they can just do an application for amendment of their license to say, we are interested in to starting a recycling project in our municipality or next to the landfill site or next to the landfill working surface. We're planning to have a material recovery facility there. Then the municipality, uh, or not only the municipality, the environmental department will come and visit and assess whether that is feasible. Then they will be granted permit or they may be required to move from the site that they were proposing to have this uh, material recovery facility to another site. So that's what the municipalities can do to say they can amend it anytime. They don't have to wait for the license to expire. They can just do an application that they can do in house. They don't need a consultant all the time to do it, to say we need to amend our license because we are starting a new waste activity of recycling, it, be it recycling, then they will hear from the department whether they are getting a, a, a positive ROD or a negative ROD or an alternative. Yeah. Thanks, Musa. And I think you're actually highlighting that there's like possibly a two-stage approach to landfill reclaimers. The first is that we have reclaim we have reclaimers on many, perhaps most of the landfills in South Africa. And for most uh, landfills, their licenses currently don't allow them to have reclaimers, but it's the reality that they're there. And in practice, you know, municipalities have had to find ways to work with reclaimers. So one thing is to amend the license now so that reclaimers can continue to do the, the work that they are doing while if I understood you correctly, you're saying municipalities should also be thinking, how do we create um, better ways for reclaimers to participate in recycling programs by, for example, creating a MRF or, you know, other opportunities for reclaimers who are at landfills to continue to uh, work in recycling, but not necessarily in those harsh landfill conditions. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Melanie. <clears throat> yes, municipalities can apply directly. And uh, we've been saying, because before the A Waste Act 2008, uh, in South Africa, we, did, we, we had a policy vacuum. There was no legislation that was governing the management of waste in the country. After fighting for that piece of legislation, uh, we now have a legislation where municipalities can amend their licenses. The licenses that were issued before 2008 <clears throat> Most of them, they only talk about uh, uh, collecting and disposing of waste. And uh, they, at that time, they were using something called uh, Municipal Systems Act 2000. And that Systems Act, it only talks about collection and disposal. And it's something that we normally say to uh, the local government, uh, SALGA, South African Local Government Association, that they will need to amend that piece of legislation as well, because when you speak to landfill managers or landfill operators, they normally tell you that the recycling part of it, it's not their responsibility. They are not permitted to allow waste pickers to be at the landfill sites. For them, they are only permitted to collect waste and dispose of at the landfill site and make sure that they cover with soil and compact it every day but the ball game have changed to say they have to have a recycling component in it because every municipality in the country, they are supposed to send their statistics every month to say this is how much uh, waste that we have collected as a municipality. That's why landfills have weigh bridges where they weigh the truck coming in and they weigh the truck coming out. Then they have an understanding as to how much waste material they have received 
at that particular landfill. And all that information is sent to the Department of Environmental Affairs to feed it onto their uh, South, African, South African waste information system, which is called SAWIS. It gives you information about each landfill site or about each municipality as to how are they are recycling rates and so on. So yeah, it is very important that legislations and licenses can be amended to suit what is happening uh, at landfill sites as we speak. Even though we're not approving that waste pickers should be working at the landfill surface, but we're saying it's better if the if every ward or every landfill has got a material recovery facility where waste pickers can operate those material recovery facility, making sure that sorting of waste take place and the compacting and bailing of waste material take place in such places rather than working at the working surface of the landfill site. Because we have seen a number of waste pickers uh, getting killed or getting paralyzed due to heavy machinery that are operating at the landfill site. I know that waste pickers are not also approving of such, but they believe that uh, municipalities need to create a, a safe, uh, conducive environment, uh, environment for waste pickers to drive. Yeah. Thank you so much, Musa. I think that's incredibly useful information for us to have. Just before I move to our next set of panelists, Eva, I, I'd like to ask you a question. Are you, are you still able to, to speak with us? Okay, man, I'm seeing. Wonderful. Can you turn on your screen again, just so people can see you? Great. So, so a, a, a question um, that arises out of, you know, Musa discussing the very difficult conditions of the landfill and reclaimers getting injured. I know that many years ago already, when you were primarily based at Palm Springs, as reclaimers, you had worked with the management of the landfill to develop a system so that different groups of people could all have access to the recyclables, but there wasn't kind of clamoring and fighting over them. Can you, can you maybe explain what you did there? Uh, okay, uh, according to the, 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 the way we were working, there was no discipline, let me put it like that. Like we were working, just go on one track and then we pull, we pull, we pull the work. Then people started fighting. Then we, we, we decided as the people who were working there as part of the community, I think I was 17 years old. We came with a, a solution uh, that we can separate ourselves according to our ages and groups. We had five groups, two groups for the younger boys and the bigger boys. We normally call them like that. Then we have a group with elderly people, which are the fathers. Then we had a group of my age, the youth, the women. Then we had a group that consists of women who are older than from 40 upwards. So we had five different groups which we named them according to their ages. Then in, in 2006, when we were given the truck by Musungkut in Palm Springs, that's when we started to introduce that law, then it started working. Up until now, it's still working. And I'm so happy to, 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 to say that I, I, I hear some good news that Palm Springs is now getting into order. There are people organizing themselves in order to stop the influx of people who are coming into the landfill. So yes, that's how we did it in the landfill. So we were separated okay. into groups. Each compactor that came, like on Monday, it's the, we start with the bigger boys, then it's the small boys, then five groups, each and every compactor that is coming, it goes which group that is starting on Monday, then the second group on Tuesday. But they are, according, according, they are going according to, by the way, we said that we're gonna start with the first group, which are the bigger boys, then the small boys, then, the grandfathers, the grannies, then the last group, it was the girls. As I was saying, most women are the ones that are disadvantaged. 
Thank you. No, th thank you, Eva. So I think what you've shown us is a couple of things. First is, is that it was reclaimers who sat together and came up with the solution. Second is that you created order by putting people into different groups. And so when one truck came, it was only one group that could go to that compactor and they would get the materials and then the others would wait their turn for the next one. And I think the third point that comes out from what you're saying is that in creating the order, you also were conscious as reclaimers to create equity between the groups because when the older women are there with the young men, then they get out competed. So this approach that you that you uh, came up with, I think sounds really useful in terms of creating equity and order and having it come from the reclaimers yourselves with with those ideas. Um, so so thank you very much, Eva. Was there something you wanted to add? Uh, like uh, in Hot Copies, which is Devland, the landfill. Uh, 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 we even, as the organization, ask the the, the 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 municipality to work in cells because there is a like there is a lot of people who are working there. They are from from like what eight hundred to a thousand of reclaimers that are working there. So we ask them to put the work in in cells. Like they'll they'll say no, the trucks are going to upload here. Then people can go and work. Then when people come this side and work, the truck goes this side and offload that side. That's how they we, we encourage them to do that because there were a lot of accidents that were happening at the landfill. Because when the trucks are coming, people are coming and flowing everywhere. So we ask the management to do cells, to say, no, this is cell A, the trucks are going to offload here in the morning, then people will work. While people are working here, the trucks offload there. Then when people move from this side, the machine pushes. So that there won't be any accident, even the cars won't hit reclaimers. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. And it's always useful to have these really practical suggestions for municipalities and private landfill owners to look at. So now I'll I'll turn over to Peter and Yuren. Um, and uh, they requested to speak as a team. So I'll just ask questions and I guess you can decide who, who answers which question. But um, so, you know, so we've heard reclaimers are on landfills. We've heard that there's ways that we can create better order while they are there. But Musa also raised the point that you know clearly the ideal situation is for reclaimers who have been working on landfills to be working in better conditions um, off a landfill. And there are also these situations which we're increasingly having in South Africa where the landfill itself is just closing. And uh, this is leaving reclaimers very concerned about what their future role will be. So, so if you can maybe tell us a little bit about how uh, other countries have been dealing with this. I know you've been developing these, I think they're called social plans. And maybe uh, if, if one of you could kick off just telling us a little bit about why it's necessary to think about reclaimers when landfills are closing. And, uh, and what are some of the ways that you've been doing it? All right, hello, Peter Cohen. I, I just, I can briefly start and then hand it over to Jerome. I just wanted to say that, you know, if for somebody who wants to understand what a social plan does, what the point of a social plan is, it's very much what we just heard. And I, I think all the points have already been raised by Ivan Musa and, and um, one is, a, is about rights. It's about, uh, it's about guaranteeing the rights of the people who are already working there and playing that role in the economy and in the environment, et cetera, in society. Uh, number two, it's about improving their conditions of work. That it's not because, because they're working there that, that they can't work under better conditions. And, and so that's why we've used it in our work in the past, upgrading. Uh, that's the kind of the idea is how can we not only guarantee the right to that work, the continued right to that work, but improve it. And um, was there, I'm trying to think if there's a third thing. Yeah, but even just hearing the way um, the recyclers organize themselves, uh, the, what, what Eva described uh, about dividing into groups and, and to make things more orderly around when the trucks came. That is exactly the kind of thing we do. So I just want to say that so much of what 
of what we're going to say has kind of already been, the groundwork has already been laid and, and maybe I'll let Jerome actually answer your question. Great, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Melanie, for the uh, invitation. Uh, yes, uh, Jeroen Eichelsen. Hi. Um, yeah, about the, as you said, about the, the social plans, I, I agree with Peter. A lot of us really in practical terms and what is about the, the, uh, the reclaimers that are on the landfill has already been, been said as such. But I think the main challenge is, is in a sense of um, working together, uh, both as, uh, as Ava mentioned, working together as reclaimers, but also especially uh, the municipality working together or the private operators or those responsible for operating the landfill. And I think it's important and what I, we, we've seen in different countries as well is that as both understand the obligations and the interests and the role of each, each has, it's easier to come also to a more sustainable solution in the future. Uh, just as uh, Ava correctly says, there are, uh, whatever they can reclaim is their income, their livelihood. At the same time, uh, operators of landfills and of uh, municipalities have a legal obligation to assure that, a, that the solid waste is treated in the right way. And um, so it, it's, it's finding that combination and, and, and understanding precisely uh, what each uh, means and entails and means and that comes to uh, uh, I think as the very practical um, solutions which Ava also mentioned of organizing uh, and that can be organized in groups can be in terms of saying well uh, this cell can work at this time this cell can work at that time and those agreements need to be made and for that it is important that the um, that there is openness on both sides uh, then there is understanding on both sides. Um, and, uh, and just to take the role in this case or the perspective from the operator, um, it's important that operators are not only are open to understanding the, the benefit of inclusion, but also on the, they can actually explain what their job is. <laughs> and, and in the end, they want to avoid, I mean, it's very simple. You want to avoid that accidents happen. You want to avoid that contamination takes place. You want to avoid that the burning of the waste takes place, which also affect the neighborhoods which just are outside of a landfill, perhaps. So, um, and and that is what, uh, and I think uh, what you, mainly related to because the focus has been mainly on this case on on landfill uh, reclaimers. Although, as you said, um, there is this shift. There are these new steps, and whereby you are going to go in, whereby you have separation at the source initiatives taking place, whereby you have um, uh, MERFs taking place, and making sure that that can have the maximum amount of inclusion is all about understanding the processes and involving those that already have experience and know how it works in that process. Mm -hmm. No, th thank you so much. And so, in, in fact, in South Africa, uh, over between 2016 and 2019, we had all of the stakeholders working together to develop this waste picker integration guideline for South Africa. And we did actually look at some of the documents uh, that you, you two have developed to take some guidance from that. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I think it would be very useful for us to hear from the two of you what are the concrete steps? What are the conditions under which, you know, municipalities and reclaimers should be thinking we need a social plan that's focused on landfills? And what are the different steps and stages you need to go through in order to do that in, in a, a holistic uh, way that, as you correctly note, includes, includes reclaimers? Okay, Melanie, great. Uh, before we dive into that, that's more the detail. I wanted to step back to your original question again. You mentioned uh, social plans. We, these days, well, they're often called more generally livelihood restoration plans. I'll get to that in a second, why, why that and what that means. Um, but we, we talk about, we've used different terms, you know, I'm not even sure, informal sector upgrading plans, uh, integration, waste picker, uh, inclusion plans, et cetera. Uh, but it's th that doesn't change the content of the plan so much uh, uh, and the mechanics of the plan, but but there are different names. Now, 
one thing I wanted to say is we're coming, I'm coming especially more than you know what I think. There are different worlds here. There are different social worlds. Uh, there's the world of the waste pickers, somebody working on, on, at the site, and then they come into contact with these institutions. They come into contact with all of these uh, actors and they have to figure out what does this mean? How does this work? How do I interact with this? Um, then you have somebody in an NGO who's maybe trying to support uh, vulnerable groups, et cetera. They get involved and they're asking their set of questions. Um, you have government, local government, you have national government, everybody has a different perspective. Um, so I'm coming at this from more from the uh, international donor perspective. So you have these big institutions like, um, you know, uh, I guess African Development Bank, a World Bank, et cetera, et cetera, all these different uh, donor organizations that finance, that give or lend governments in South Africa would be lending, uh, lend governments money to, uh, uh, for example, to upgrade their waste system. So when, when you say landfill, I think you're talking about open dumps. So we would call it an open dump. And what you wanna do is close the landfill or rehabilitate, upgrade the landfill and, and open, I mean, sorry, close the dump or rehabilitate the dump and open a landfill a modern what they call a modern sanitary landfill we won't get into detail about what that is but it's but often this process involves the exclusion of the informal actors who are working there and often this is done with very little interest in what was happening on the landfill. nobody cares they they only care about improving the waste system and and putting in this model all right, so, so then the donors come along with their money and they have conditions. And the, the, the purpose of these conditions is to try to put a break sometimes on, on governments when they ignore social and economic issues because they have other priorities and it's to make sure that these issues are not completely forgotten. Uh, and so that's when my job comes in, for example. So, uh, so waste pickers enter this process as what they call an affected group. Tell me if I'm going too fast, you or too slow. You, you're closing an open dump to open a modern sanitary landfill, but there's people gaining their livelihoods on that site and from that waste stream. And so by closing it, you are affecting, you are negatively affecting. Them. And so that's when the donors say, hey, we have policies, we can't hurt anybody. We need to do something for these people, all right? And that is the trigger for somebody like me to come in. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if Yuro has something to add to that, but that is really the, that is the background of where these plans come from. Ideally, governments would be doing them and sometimes they do, sometimes they do. For example, I am in Brazil right now, I live in Brazil and here in Brazil, there have been local governments, state and municipal governments that have done this kind of work very well without being pressured by donor conditions, okay? But, uh, but, but there's always pressure. I think that's a really important point. And what we're hearing here is that there, there's a lot of power relations here. And you have, for example, a private actors, powerful private actors that see uh, income generating opportunities for themselves. So they may actually be working against the interests of the, uh, of the waste pickers. Then you have uh, the reclaimers. Then you have uh, governments who have their own interests. Maybe they're more interested in getting it done fast or they have some other, some other uh, uh, priority more important to them than the well-being of the reclaimers, okay? So I think it's important to, yeah, please. Melanie. Yeah, so if I, can, if I can just jump in, I'm just conscious of time because we still need to hear from yeah. Federico. Um, uh, we are very lucky here in South Africa that we do now have this uh, waste picker integration guideline. Um, 
And uh, the National Waste Management Strategy of 2020 says that you know, municipalities need to be integrating reclaimers. So I think we do have this internal uh, energy um, around needing to engage and integrate reclaimers, including reclaimers on landfills. If I can just ask one of you to very quickly, just in maybe two minutes or three minutes, give us a sense practically, what does it mean? So let's say, uh, we, I think we have some officials from Cape Town here who are very interested in reclaimer integration and have started to do some really good work. The municipality Cape Town comes and says to you as international experts, we want to come with a, a plan. Uh, we want to work with reclaimers to develop a plan, a social plan for reclaimers at landfills in Cape Town. What, what are the steps in your process that you're saying people need to go through? Get on. You want to do it? I'll do it. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie, for that. Um, I think the first step is to acknowledge that you have to understand the system. You have to be open to understanding how the system works. And that is not only, and that means understanding all the different actors, understanding how do the waste flows go in your, in your, in your city or in your catchment areas or your province or in your state. I think that is starting point. If you don't take that as a starting point, then you're going to exclude persons and you're going to have oversight and that at one point will yeah, lead to, um, uh, to the wrong decisions being made. Um, and, and that means also, um, and that means also going outside of a landfill at the same time, because it means also understanding that how the recycling system in your, in your city works, who, who are the buyers, are there already, as you say, street reclaimers? How is that dynamic taking place? And, and in a sense, a social plan or a yeah, integrated inclusive solid waste plan should involve all those different elements. And then you look into what, what, what is everybody, and, and, and then you have to go into seeing what uh, are the strengths of all the different parties, where are the main clashes, and you have to look into, um, understand as well, that you have to go beyond what's only the, uh, the dry fraction. You also have to be open and to understand, well, we also have the organic fraction, what something has to be done with. And that, I mean, there are examples also from, from India where they have a lot of decentralized composting taking place as a, as a um, strategic strategy at larger city levels which can also be very inclusive of, of, of different uh, social groups living and working in the city. So I think, as I said, st step one and understand the whole system. Step two, bring all those stakeholders together and let them see the different parts of the, the activities that they do. I think that is important as well. I mean, it, I think it's, just for a landfill uh, operator might never have visited a, um, a recycling junk shop owner or the other way around. So to that you come together and, and that you make whatever is uh, the problem that needs to be solved, a joint problem to be solved. And I think that is, I mean, and, and from there on, you, you will have to, uh, you have to decide, about financial agreements, institutional agreements, and that will depend on the different cities. And you, you will get maybe a shift from um, effectively, as Peter said, you, you get, might get a situation where a dump is going to be closed. And that for other reasons, and I mean, there will be different reasons taken into account for deciding where another facility would, take, would, would be placed. Mm -hmm. That is, um, but it, I think Ava said it very clearly, you mean, uh, don't take decisions without us. I mean, that is, I think that's the clear message. And I think that is, and, and that's something which also acknowledge that this is not something old that takes place overnight, even though at the same time, a municipality has to face with the fact that solid waste is being generated every day. I mean, so, so, so there is that friction there as well. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there because I, I understand you also Thank have to be uh, short on time. Melanie, do we have a moment for me to run very quickly through the basic steps? Really just list uh, them? Yes, or no? I think we do. 
Just okay, then I'll, so people I'll go get really fast. I promise. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, we like to talk about this stuff. Okay. Um, so the basic steps, I mean, look, the first thing you've got to do is exactly what, what we've been hearing the, throughout this session is, is engage. You've got to engage the waste pickers themselves from the beginning. So that's number one. Um, number two is you need to collect data. You need to understand, uh, not just talk to the waste pickers, but have data on them. Who are they? Uh, what are their incomes? How are they organized? Uh, who do they interact with? What is the entire system? As Jerome was saying, you look, need to look at the larger system, formal and informal. How does it work? Where, who do they sell to? How much money do they make? Where does it go next? What does everybody do? Uh, then um, you need to understand uh, uh, what the alternatives are, what, what, what opportunities are available, what are the constraints, what kind of problems might you face, et cetera, et cetera. Then you take all of that and it, together in a discussion, again, with the waste pickers and other, other what we call key st stakeholders, people who have you know, a, a, a reason to be involved in this, you develop a set of, of options. And you want to have not just one option. I'll give you an example. I mean, I, sometimes you hear somebody say things like, we're going to take 200 waste pickers and we're going to employ them in a factory. No, that's not the way you do this. Uh, you need to develop a, a set of options. They need to be tailored to the different groups because the, the waste pickers are not all the same. They want different things, they have different uh, strengths and weaknesses, et cetera. So you have to develop a, a, a pretty complex set of options. And then you need to give people the chance to choose among those options. And some of those options will be inside the waste system, the new improved system, improved we hope, and some will be maybe outside. They may be other kinds of opportunities, okay? Um, and so that's basically what it is. That's basically what the plan is. And in a future opportunity, we could go more deeply into the kinds of things you, you, you know, specifics that go into that, but that's basically what you no, thank you. Thank you so much. And I do think maybe we need to look at having a session specifically on this, where we also have reclaimers who've gone through the processes to talk about their experiences uh, around that. One of the things I'd like to note, you know, for the participants uh, here who haven't engaged in, in the work you've been doing uh, until now, is that also it's the notion that if you know, as, as Peter, you said, you know, not everyone is going to go to a new recycling project. People may aspire to do other things and it may not be possible to include everyone. And I think that's a really important component of the work that you're doing. Also, that it's not just training, but it's also financial payments um, because we, this is equivalent to a retrenchment um, and that we need to think of it this way. So I know this is something reclaimers in South Africa have been talking about. Um, uh, we have our last speaker, who is Federico Parra from Wigo, and uh, Federico asked if he couldn't please, please, please show uh, a bit of a slide presentation. And because he's last, um, I think uh, I think it's fine, Federico. It would be wonderful to see from you uh, uh, your presentation on the Latin American experiences. Are you able to share your screen? Please confirm that I that you see my screen. So, so Federico, we can see your screen, and I just want to say we really need a maximum of, of 10 minutes in the yeah. presentation, and then we can come back for questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, the first issue, as uh, Peter mentioned, is that we need to be in the same page. And this being the same page means visibilization and understand better the role of waste speakers in the street, but also in the dome site. In this triple uh, or three different role as providers of raw materials to the industry, as environmental actor, but overall as a providers of services. And the main issue here is that uh, for the current model of transport, collection, and burial, but also the new paradigm of a uh, circular economy, way speakers remain invisible. And it means that extended producer responsibility, privatization, incinerization, and other issues that comes are linked to dump site closure uh, needs to be open and have the voice of the waste speakers and their organizations inside. Just to mention, we did a quite intensive work of uh, diagnosis of the human rights 
situation of way speakers in 14 Central American dome sites and other countries. And also uh, we support the mapping of many organization of way speakers in Latin America during the pandemic. And this allow us to have a quite deep in perspective of their situation. As you may know, the, in this graph, uh, the majority of the countries in Latin America have dome sites and controlled dome sites as a main uh, this final disposal system. And this means that landfills, or uh, dome sites, not landfills, dome sites represent the livelihood of hundreds of thousands of white speakers. And at the same time, many violations of human rights happens there, as uh, uh, Eva mentioned. This shows us that we are facing a, a quite controversial issue, is that work at the landfill is not desirable, but the landfill should not, the dome site should not be closed without labor alternatives and without protecting the livelihoods of the families who depend on the work on it. Uh, indeed, the expulsion of the waste speakers or the threat of expulsion became, in a way, uh, a violation of our human rights. You, uh, we found that in many uh, of the these dome sites, the, there are people who control the dome site and, and there are not in the proper way. So in sometimes we found that gang banks or uh, private companies have almost the same behavior against way speakers. There are prosecution of the organizational form. They, many cases don't want that voice speakers get organized. The health, housing, and uh, sanitary conditions that uh, were mentioned for my predecessors, and the extreme use of violence. In some cases, like uh, Zona 3 in Guatemala, is the dump site itself uh, trapped because in the rainy season flows and many way speakers die there. In other cases, privatizations, uh, of the waste management and recyclables comes with a resonance against uh, waste speakers. And, and this becomes a terrible situation of violation of human rights. As uh, all of the presenters says, dome sites uh, closure is a worldwide trend. In the, in the Latin American case, there is a coalition that is working with the progressive or gradual closure of dump sites. And all these environmental uh, ministers signed these uh, procedures. They uh, want as a goal have in 2013, uh, the 64% of the dump site closures. Uh, they have a roadmap document and these roadmap do document have a chapter a, of uh, social inclusion or social plan. But this needs to be more robust. This needs to be concerned and dialogue with way speakers organization uh, because it doesn't have to be just in the hands of local authorities as uh, Peter mentioned and, and Jerome also, not in the hands of the administrator of the dump site. It's an issue that needs to be uh, transform and work with uh, way speakers and its organization and national and local authorities and other actors. What alternative remain? And I, this is the core of my presentation. The Latin American network of way speakers developed for three months some statements, messages that are quite close with the steps that uh, Peter mentioned. And I ask you or your partner, I want to read it. The first mention, message is that Red Lacre, which is the name of Latin American Network, does not seek to perpetuate on site work or extreme working condition there, but the closure, but uh, it does want the protection of the livelihood of the way speakers and their families who depend on working at the dump site. The second one is that the way speakers who work in landfills obtain their livelihoods from this exercise and have an historical uh, development. This added to this human rights perspective means that they should be protected, reintegrated in the workforce, or sufficiently compensated in which, in the context of the closure of the landfill. 
The third message is that uh, Red Lacre advocate and promote the construction of participatory solution adapted to the territorial, social, organizational, and economic context. As uh, Jerome mentioned, one country is quite different from another. The main message is that any downside closure initiative should be fully identified the stakeholders, all the actors who live or from these livelihoods in this uh, um, progressive and priority uh, sense. First of all, the way speakers and workers from the downside. Second, the family of uh, way speakers, the people who transport uh, in formal or informal their raw and recyclable materials and the other people who live around and depends on the downside. The five uh, messages after full identification, a uh, way speaker must be, or it must have uh, all the information, accompaniment in organization, the promotion of these scenarios and promote uh, and maintain this organization promotion. The sixth one is that a, a livelihood protection, labor reintegration and compensation plan should be formulated. It's more than a social one, uh, as, as of course you may know. Uh, and needs funds, needs responsibilities, and needs time. And this quite, is quite important. Sometimes the closure of the downside times are not the times for reintegration and needs to be harmonized. Integration, reintegration takes more time as a structural uh, downside closure in Brazil show us. Finally, ownership of productive alternatives should be in the hands of wage speakers. And this is so important because we have bad uh, examples like Chureka or other ones on which a a productive initiative remain in the hands of privates. And this needs to be uh, accompanied by other actors. Briefly, this is more or less the road to influence downside closure plans in this integration chapter. And uh, as we go, we are not only creating this uh, brief um, report on the situation of human rights, but um, we submit a face of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, uh, this report, and we want that this is a actor be part of the process. Finally, a toolbox, uh, that allow organization of wage speakers that are in the dumb sites to have a human rights perspective uh, and to put its own voice related to these demands and construct a participatory this, this situation. Just to end, I want to show you some interesting cases. This is not working now because burns, but this dumb site in Guatemala has a quite interesting issue. It's a transitory process in which way speakers can have a specific area to um, separate these materials, have a, a specific uh, time to collect directly from the dump site uh, by colors, allowing different people, elderly people, women and, and men, have access to the material in equal form. And this area, on which uh, intermediary people comes to buy. But the most interesting issue here is that uh, the administrator of the dump site create sanitary areas, bathrooms, uh, workshops to make um, things with recyclables and uh, urban agriculture area for the waste speakers. The other case that I want to highlight is the case of Ciudad Sandino in Nicaragua, which have a dump site uh, but they are trying to make a transition to collect in the streets. And this takes a lot of time. It's not easy. It's a change of, of way of work, creates uh, different practices, uh, but it's one of the, the alternatives. Finally, structural dump sites in Brazil and many dump sites in Argentina, which way speaker organizations support with uh, the feder federation of uh, recyclers, uh, waste pickers, uh, uh, human uh, car horses, um, uh, waste pickers also are there. This is more or less what I want to share with you. Uh, I know we have, we can talk a lot uh, 
about this, but uh, I think this complete the messages. Thanks, Melan. Sorry, uh, I've run. <laughs> No, there's nothing to be sorry about. You went four minutes over time, but it was an absolutely fantastic presentation and you've opened our eyes to so many issues that we haven't even started to consider. And I think to understand the processes that you've been going through in Latin America and particularly the work that the reclaimer organizations and networks have been doing around this, it is extremely um, powerful for us to be engaging with. And I'm sure Arrow and Saupa may also have some, some points to raise about that, but I think we do need to be having more of these exchanges. As, as many participants in the workshop know, we've already learned a great deal um, from the work that you and the reclaimers in, in Bogota and Colombia, where you live and work have done around payments uh, for integration, which is something we're just beginning to work on now. And, and now it's, it's really, um, uh, we're very thankful that we can learn from you about landfills as well. So with that, um, I really wanna thank this remarkable panel and we are going to open to questions. There have been a lot of questions that have been asked in the Q and A box and the chat box. My colleague uh, Pierre has been going through them and pulling out some uh, of key, you know, summarizing questions. So I will ask, go through the list sent from Pierre, and I will ask the questions. Maybe I can ask all of the panelists to turn on your screens because I think re really anyone who wants to ask uh, ask a question or answer a question is welcome to do so. So the first question is a question about the complex relationships between reclaimers and municipalities. For example, when reclaimers decide not to sell materials to the municipal buyback center, when reclaimers work for themselves in a municipal MRF, reclaimers not reclaiming enough volumes for a feasible business model. Uh, and I see uh, Eva has already partially answered that question by saying one of the issues with the municipal buyback centers is that they pay less money. And I think that um, this is a, a significant problem uh, that the reclaimers are encountering. Um, is there anyone else who would like to respond to that question? Does anyone have something to add to Eva's response? Perhaps even um, other people from Arrow or Salpa? Okay, I think we can move to the next question, but I just want to note drawing on what the speakers have been saying is that the this then shows to me that it's likely that reclaimers were not fully involved in developing these programs and proposals. Um, because if it's something that they aren't participating in, then it's, it's likely not designed uh, with them in mind. And so I think in terms of the points that have been really highlighted by all of the speakers, the need to be working with reclaimers and making decisions collectively could perhaps help to resolve some of these issues. There's a second question on medical health support that could be offered. Is there someone who would like to respond to that question? What, uh, what was the question, the it, it, it's a, What kind of medical support and health support could be offered to reclaimers? <clears throat> yeah, what, what we have tried in South Africa was that uh, waste pickers should get a, a jab for, for, because they're handling waste. Waste, we know that uh, even municipal workers uh, they normally get injections to prevent diseases uh, that they may get from waste. So it's, um, it's something that we are still struggling. I know that it has happened only in Devon that I'm aware of where waste pickers have been injected to try and make sure that they don't get diseases that are born from uh, waste. Yeah, so far that's what has happened. But for now, the main focus is to make sure that Waste pickers are recognized, are integrated, and all of that. So, but we should not forget that waste pickers should waste pickers' health is also important. Yeah. Great. Now, thank you, Musa. And I've just seen that in the chat box, Eva had responded to that question. Um, 
Uh, and she said, reclaimers struggle when they go to clinics, it takes them time and for that day they lose an income. But when the mobile clinic can come to the landfills, then that could save them a lot of time and so that they can have a chance to work after that. So I think that's a very concrete proposal from Eva around having mobile clinics coming to landfills and other places where um, reclaimers are working in, in, in the streets. Uh, Louis from Arrow asked uh, the question, can municipal officials be part of these webinars? So Louis Salga is inviting all of the municipalities uh, to attend and participate. And we do have a number of municipalities who are here, but I think, yes, we can be doing more to encourage more municipal officials and perhaps elected uh, politicians to attend. So it, maybe we can strategize around, around how we can get more people involved. There's a question for Peter and Joran. Um, can you provide examples of actual social plans and initiatives implemented in Brazil and other places? Uh, examples of plans? Yes, yes, there are quite a few. I, we might have to scramble for links and things like that, but uh, Yuru may have a more specific uh, answer than, but I would say the, the example of Belo Horizonte, the example uh, that was mentioned, I believe Federico mentioned of Brasilia, the Villa Estructural, the example of Gramacho, Jardim Gramacho in Rio. These are examples that are very, very well documented. You could Google them and probably find information on those, at least those three. I, I don't know if everyone wants to add anything. Yeah, maybe just perhaps also add another one in uh, at a much smaller scale, but at the same time, I think uh, in, in Belize, where effectively you have a process of, you have a, a dump site which was effectively closed, but uh, within a relatively short distance, there was a transfer station opened and the transfer station focused on having the same sorting environment and retrieval and reclaiming environment that was on the pre previously like within the, within the uh, dump site. So within a better working environment, the same activities and the same process actually that Ava mentioned was on working in turns, working in shifts, uh, this coordination between when do trucks arrive, when can you actually have access to the, to the waste stream to recover the materials, and then uh, the heavy machinery can come in and, 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 and push away uh, that specific waste so it can be transferred to the new landfill. Uh, yeah, those processes took place and that involved training, involved uh, coming to agreements on uh, PPEs, involved also um, agreements. Right now, the, the, the recyclers, they can come themselves, they have, they can come themselves to the, uh, to the transfer station. Whatever they recover is their access, is their right, their material. So those, um, uh, those negotiations and those coming to an understanding is, is a product of a, of, of a process. Um, and of course, it's a smaller scale. I mean, in the end now it's about, uh, it involves 30, 40 people, but still it, it's related to the amount of waste which in this case is being processed. So uh, yeah, that's just one example um, other than the examples of Peter Bench as well. Great, no, no, thank you so much to both of you. And I think um, Peter, if you are able to send links to reports or copies of reports, that would be fantastic and then I can share them with um, with all of the participants here and I, I should mention that this webinar series that we're doing is part of a broader program on training and capacity building for integration where we're designing a series of workshops for municipal officials and reclaimers how to move through our steps in the South African guideline to design and implement and monitor and evaluate integration in a participatory way. So we are bringing in material from other places and, um, you know, for, for the participants from South Africa, I think what we can say is we can try to build in some of this uh, concrete information into the materials that we draw on and distribute as part of those training workshops. Um, there is a question. Um, how, as waste pickers, do we run away from municipalities that support in terms of safety, place to work, financial support? However, when you are selling to private reclaimers, hmm. 
Um, I'm, I don't know who, who asked this question. Could you maybe um, share it with us directly? Could you speak to it? Pierre, can you see who is the person who asked that question? All right, if we can ask uh, the person who asked that question perhaps to rephrase it. Are there any questions that are in the chat box that we haven't addressed? And are there any new questions? You're welcome to put up your hand if you would like to ask a question. I see Eddie raising a hand. Um, Nahomi, are you able to unmute Ellie so that he can make a comment? Ellie, you're welcome to go ahead. Um, Nahomi, are you able to enable Ellie to speak? Yeah, I think now he can talk. Okay, thanks. Ali, go ahead. Um, sorry, I, I, I just missed the question, sorry. Oh, you had your hand up that you wanted to speak. Oh, oh. oh no, no, I think it was me not uh, understanding the controls. No, I think the question, the issue that I had was resolved really, which was for, for us to have, uh, you know, some examples of, um, of what these social plans actually look like, you know, uh, in those countries, uh, Brazil, I think, the, the question was answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ellie. Calvin Sargent, you have a question? Yes, hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, well, I think it's day by you because I'm calling from New Delhi in India. So it's not time here. But, 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 and I work with the ILO and I saw a lot of questions about, you know, what can be done in terms of, you know, waste pickers and their fundamental principles and rights at work. Just to say that we in the ILO, we have a lot of material and information on, on in that area. It's, it's certainly an area that we deal with quite a lot in the ILO. But my question really that I would like someone to speak to is, you know, the whole impact of the pandemic on waste pickers, what has been the impact of that on them and whether there have been any, let's say, measures or assistance to these waste pickers, you know, who have been seriously affected by the corona pandemic. I assume that most of them are really in the informal sector with lack of social protection. And it would be good if somebody can just a few words on these issues. Thank you very much. No, th thank you. And if you do have any documents that you think would be useful for us, please send them to me and I will share them with, uh, with all of the participants. Uh, Joran, is your hand raised to respond to that question? Uh, no, it's to, no, it's just to add something else, but I'll, I'll... Okay, so let's first see. Um, Ellie, I don't know if you or anyone from Arrow wants to comment on how reclaimers were affected in uh, South Africa and what you've done to respond. And then Musa, I can ask you to do the same. And if there are representatives from SALPA, Ellie? Yes, um, uh, and I think in the issues, yes, um, we, you know, there, there's a lot of issues that have uh, affected us, um, 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 some of which Eva has, has mentioned, you know, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, disorder in the landfills, uh, leading to conflict, uh, no proper cooperation between the reclaimers and the landfill managers which needed to be resolved. And in some instances, you know, uh, the involvement of uh, criminal uh, groups, you know, who come in, infiltrate the, the landfill, because it's a, it's a perfect space, I think, for all sorts of activities from hiding, you know, contraband to actually taking over recycling, um, um, et cetera. I think those are, but the key thing I think is, is really a, a lack of uh, of cooperation, and I think that the speakers have mentioned again and again the the need for stakeholders to get together 
you know, we, we, we don't really have that in a, in a lot of municipalities yet, uh, particularly when it comes to, to landfills. Um, there, there is very little at the moment uh, cooperation. And, and so one of the things that we will be doing going forward as ARO is, is of course, um, um, in the context of the fact that we are anticipating the closure of, of, of the first few landfills in Johannesburg within the next few years. Um, is that we are going to be formally taking up, you know, um, um, as, as um, has been suggested, uh, yes, as in the case of Colombia, to, to organize struggles around around these, and that the first step is going to be for us is going to be organizing. So we're in the process of uh, of, uh, of 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 doing that, and then of course the the what the speakers uh, experience. Um, is going to be very helpful. So we are uh, grateful for the documents that will be provided. And of course, the case of India, um, I forgot, I didn't catch your name, the gentleman who responded to the question was in New Delhi at the moment. I think uh, we would be love to get in touch with everyone just to see how you've confronted uh, all of these issues and, and, and so that we can learn lessons from, from your experience. Okay, no, no, thank you, Ali. Musa and Federico, I see your hands are up. Are you going to respond to the question around COVID-19? Yes. yes. Okay, let, let's start with Musa and then we go to Federico. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Kelvin, for the question. Yes, uh, the pandemic have uh, affected the way speakers in the country. Uh, there were positives and negatives uh, in my observation on this. Uh, in, we, we have seen uh, some way speakers getting arrested, two way speakers getting arrested as a result of failing to obey the rules of COVID, which are now have been released and all of that. And we have also seen way speakers struggling during this time of the pandemic because they would go and collect the materials, but no one will come and buy because the factories were not processing the materials that they were collecting. So that's that's another way that have affected them. But at the same time, the positive side of it, this as a, this this pandemic have exposed a, we speakers to government. Now government nationally, even the president speak about we speakers. We, they spoke about we speakers for the first time in the in in the presidential speech. So now we know that we speakers in South Africa are recognized. The opportunity was presented by COVID-19. I don't think the president in his speech would have said anything about we speakers because now uh, some we speakers have got a protective clothing that is coming straight from government. Uh, and there were some relief that were provided, even though there were hiccups regarding those reliefs, but the recognition of waste speakers in the country have really taken place. People know knows that if you're talking about waste speakers, who are you really talking about? So there were positive and negatives regarding the COVID-19 and waste speakers. Thank you. Shall and I jump in? And, and Federico, I'm going to actually interrupt you. We only have eight minutes left, and there are at least two people who have questions. But perhaps uh, you can write a response in the box. And if you can give the links to the Global Rec site, where I know you and colleagues have worked with reclaimers to develop a lot of information for reclaimers and others on, on COVID-19, that would be great. Um, Georgina, you have a question and Rini had a question. If you can just ask your questions briefly and then we can get some quick responses. Georgina, go ahead. Hi, this is Georgina from Women of Waste. Uh, quick question for the guys uh, working in Latin America, maybe interesting also for Eva as well. What about long-term training uh, or opportunities or entrepreneurial opportunities? I've seen uh, for women on, or, or women and men on working on dump sites. For example, I know in New York, they put out a tender to support entrepreneurs in, in uh, to develop their own waste management companies. Could you ever imagine, or have you tried things such as this, like incubators to, to offer long-term opportunities when the landfills have closed? Thank you. Fantastic. And, and Rini, do you still have a question? Okay, if Rini is not here, um, Federico, please go ahead okay. and answer the question. Yeah, Georgina, the main issue is that you need a collective subject to do that. The first issue, 
uh, that needs to be addressed is that many way speakers in town sites are not organized. And it's quite important to have a collective voice because if not, what you have is individual training that doesn't uh, transform itself in an alternative. Um, the other issue is that this uh, training needs to be part of a plan of integration. Means this transition that allow them to be part of some business related to collect, transport, and recycle, or make separation in, in plants needs to be part of, of this collective uh, action. What the experience told us or teach us is that if you do that in terms of individuals, they are contracted and expulsed at the same time, uh, like the case of the Chureca in Nicaragua or other case in Santiago de los Caballeros in, in Dominican Republic. The second issue is that uh, non-government accept the violation of human rights as following your question. But what we achieve is that the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights made a sort of recommendation in, in 2019 report related to have visible the needs of the way speakers and that the government needs to provide them some basis platforms to discuss its own issues. And, and I really want to highlight that the main issue here, as Melanie mentioned, is in this integration process is that authorities and uh, BB, uh, authorities understand that way speakers needs to be visible in the scenario and needs to be uh, sit in the same uh, round table to construct their own solutions. Nothing of with, uh, related to them without them. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank, thank you, you. very much, mm -hmm. Federico. Um, Rini, uh, did you still want to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you, Melanie. I think um, Musa actually answered me uh, because my question was about if the pickers for uh, if the reclaimers work in the mirth, if they move from the landfill to the mirth, then they on the landfill as well. They're on the property of the of the municipality, but it it seems maybe less than a problem. But now they work in the mirth, so what you know sort of the i think the relationship can become quite tricky because they actually on they work for themselves but they're on the in the MRF and that's the property of the municipality so i was asking the maybe the negotiation of this um the relationship because they're still independent i assume um, and for instance if i say for instance as a researcher i want to talk to the reclaimers whose permission do I want, do, do I get? <laughs> I, I need to get the reclaimer's permission, but also do I need to get permission from the municipality to access the reclaimers? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So I think it yes. becomes a yeah. relationship and I think it's important that we discuss this. Um, does, does anyone on the panel have a, have a quick response to that? Uh, if I understand Rini's correct question correctly, she's saying if a municipality provide space to reclaimers to have their own MRF to be doing a project, should the, the municipality uh, be required to provide permission to talk to the reclaimers? Mm. Uh, what is the relationship here? Uh, is, is there anyone who'd like to tackle that? Yeah, Melanie, I can say something on that. Uh, in South Africa, it depends on the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, between waste pickers that are working at the material recovery facility as well as to the municipality. But for us, if you want to go and visit waste pickers at any material recovery facility, we just go there. We even take visitors there to go and take photos if they want to without any approval from the municipality. But it depends on the MOU between the municipality and the waste picker cooperative or the waste pickers that are working at the center. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Musa. We have two minutes left. Uh, Joram, you were wanting to make a, an additional contribution? Yeah, maybe just to answer the question to, uh, that Georgina had as well about the social inclusion. I think it's important that the social inclusion doesn't stop while when the plan has been made. I think it's important mm -hmm. that, it, that um, municipalities 
also reserve staff time and budget for inclusivity. So it's, it, it goes beyond just maybe hiring a consultant or something. You should actually have people being able to dedicate to that. And how many that people that is depends on the municipality, the size. But at Horizonte at one stage had 13 people at a, at a department of 13 people in the municipality whose focus was social inclusion at the high point of, 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 of all that activity. Maybe now it's 15, 20 years ago, but it is important that if you don't, within the municipality reserve that, that is also an important aspect, then you can't also expect to be, give a permanent and sustainable accompaniment of the process. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. We are, we have a minute left, um, but we do have hands up from Calvin and uh, I cannot see the other name. Um, so if we can ask you to just very quickly ask your, your question or make your comment, and then we can maybe have a quick response uh, before we close the webinar. Calvin? Uh, hi, uh, thanks, Melanie. Uh, I'll be very quick. Um, I think the platform is quite a very good platform for the integration. Uh, I'll be speaking from one of the previously disadvantaged entrepreneurs in the recycling market in the Jobek uh, platform that uh, perhaps this uh, platform needs to be extended uh, to the major buyers in the market so that uh, we can accelerate the integration uh, so that uh, we, we can also unlock the big data that is bottled up between the reclaimers, the buyback center owners, and the end users being your NAMPEC, uh, your impact, and the so on, because I think there's so much, um, uh, 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 this isolation between all the parties. So we need the industry drivers, which are the volume drivers. And this time around, we're looking at the buyback center owners who are also trying to come in this space and using the digital infrastructure so that uh, the municipality obviously can get the data read whenever they want to open up circular opportunities for both the recyclers and the informal uh, reclaimers. Um, uh, but with respect to time, I'd make my contribution more effectively in this space of integration. Great. No, th thank you so much, Calvin, for, for your input. Yam Kala? <clears throat> okay, no. no, I wanted to comment on the, um, whether uh, you have to consult the municipality in terms of accessing the waste because firstly, this is too old. Um, I would advise the private uh, people, the institutions, to consult the municipalities firstly and foremost. Uh, in our region, we had a problem where private reclaimers from all over the country, from Job and Deb, and they would go to waste pickers, uh, come up with high prices, they take their product, and they vanish with the money. So it's always fair to include, even if we're not going to be part of the MOU that we have with the base pickers, but to, to be part of us. Secondly, when there are funds from your RASPO, from your, from, your, from your provincial department, who are always uh, writing letters of support for small businesses that are venturing in recycling space. So by being away uh, from the municipality and not including and talking directly to the base pickers, it is very hard for, for private um, uh, small businesses to crawl. Thirdly, uh, usually uh, municipalities uh, do appoint on a seasonal basis the private uh, reclaimers versus municipalities. So when they operate in uh, isolation or in, 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 uh, with the waste pickers, it is really hard for the municipalities to assist those small businesses. Thank you. No, th thank you, thank you, Young Kala, for your for your input. And I'm sorry we don't have time to take these discussions further. So I would really like to thank our panelists for a very stimulating, informative um, conversation that we've all had. And I think we've learned a great deal from each of you. And taking that knowledge in combination, it, it gives us some really um, fresh ideas in terms of how to move forward with respect to landfill reclaimer integration in South Africa. So thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and experience with us. And thank you very much to all of the participants in the webinar. And um, we really appreciate you staying on until the, the end of the webinar. We know you have many other obligations. We will be sending out the presentations and other information. And eventually we will send out the video of the webinar and make it available. 
Thank you once again, everyone, for coming. And we will also email you about future webinars on this issue of reclaimer integration. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.